I tell you what, stuff just accumulates. You know what I'm talking about? I praise God. <laughs> I tell you what, and it's also in a Christian's life, sometimes stuff accumulates. And sometimes, little by little, it starts accumulating in your system and in you as a Christian. You find yourself compromising. You find yourself having not one opinion, but two. You serve God on one hand and man on the other in the world. And God said, I'm a jealous God. I can't have you serving the things of the world and me at the same time. In 1 Kings 18, this is the heart and the states of the children of Israel. They were serving God, quote unquote, but changing the rules just a little bit to satisfy the flesh. And it stemmed from the leadership. It stemmed from Ahab and Jezebel and the 450 prophets of Baal and all these different ones that worship false gods. Oh, they still had God in there, but he was just one of the many things that they worshiped and had in their lives. This morning I'm here to tell you we're getting close to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is preparing his church, his bride, to be spotless and white and ready. So this morning, he is going to purify his church with fire. Fire is used to show a power source, but also it's showed and used to show a cleansing, to cleanse the heart and life of men. On the day of Pentecost, when fire separated and fell on each one of them, it was a sign to them. He only had to do it one time as a sign to them to show that fire came before the rain. Before we could see the abundance of rain of revival, fire must fall on his church one more time. A consuming fire that burns up all the dross and sin of our lives. They would walk after the things of God and not the things of man. Hallelujah. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings 18, 17 to 46. Before there's rain, there must be fire. Verse 17 says, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou the troubler of Israel? Why did he say that? You see, Elijah prayed three and a half years earlier. Don't let it rain. You know what happens when you don't have rain? There's drought. The land is dry. In fact, Ahab, him and a couple of his friends were going out to find and see if there's any of their animals left. They were going to use one to ride on the other one. They were going to take and kill so they have food. But this was the trouble of Israel. He was the cause. No. Listen, verse 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of Groves 400. That's 850. In my math, even from Warden, Illinois. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the prophets of Groves 400, which eat at the Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And the people said not a word. One of the worst things you can do as a Christian in your testimony of your life is to not say a word. To bury your light under a bushel. To never answer for nothing. You wonder why the church doesn't testify today? Because they're torn between two opinions. They don't want to witness because they don't have nothing to witness with. The things in the, in the conviction in the life is not there. The fire is not there because God is not fully there because their lives are out of balance. They still like the things of the world and the flesh, 
So how can they testify to their friends about God when they will be called hypocrites? Hear the word of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Then he said, verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. That's called cows. <laughs> and let them choose one bullock for themselves, cut it into pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under it. He knew these people, tricksters. <laughs> Hallelujah. Put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock Lay it on the wood, and I will put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your little gods, and I will call upon the Lord and my God. And that answereth by fire, let him then be God. Putting himself to a major test here, isn't he? How many times have you seen this happen in the Word of God? Where a guy cuts up a bullock and says, he's going to answer by fire today. And show you he's God. You better have heard from God. Are you kidding me? Be make me calling up Staunton, the governor, the mayor, saying, hey, tell everybody to meet me up there on the top of Staunton Hill out there, and we're going to call upon the name of God who is God. If your religious gods of dead man's stones and bones is God, you call upon in him. And if God is God, then I will call upon God, and he'll answer by fire. You know how we can still see this today? Is the church that is on fire for God. If you're burning and not consumed, and that fire is burning in your life, they're going to say, God, He is God. Hallelujah. And the people answered and said, Hey, well spoken. This is cool. We got ourselves a show today. Huh. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one of the bullocks for yourselves. Dress it first. For you many. Call in the name of your gods but put no fire under it. Verse 26, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, imagine that, or nor any of the answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Just because people get excited at a major auditorium, and the music shouting, and they're jumping up and down, does not mean God is there. Hello. Just because they got all the things just drummed up the right way, their emotions are moved. Go to a KISS concert. That's a spiritual revival service, I'm telling you. Listen. They can manipulate through their music and their, and their, their show to cause these young people to do whatever they want because the spirit behind it is satanic. Listen to me this morning. I watched something the other day. This was very old school. They actually had a record and they were playing it backwards. I always understood back masking was done on purpose. Oh no. The stairway to heaven, Led Zeppelin. He says, this was not done by back masking. You see the Satan kind of power behind the message in this music. The Satan knew what he was saying. And when they played it backwards, it was unbelievable what I heard. Unbelievable. About 666. About how Satan was Lord. And how it caused you to worship me. Sounds really cool. When she gets there, you know. All this stuff. And she's buying the stairway to heaven. That's no place that Satan wants you. He wants you in the pits of hell. Or ACDC. I'm on the highway to hell. That, that's not even back mask. That's straightforward. Okay? It's not. I paid my dues playing in a rock and roll band. So now I'm going to party the rest of my eternity with Satan. I'm on the highway to hell and I'm enjoying every minute of it. I got news for that young man and the rest of his followers. When they get there, they'll know, yeah, all the doors will be closed and there will be no stairway to heaven and they'll live in torment with that liar devil the rest of their lives. I'm here to tell you, this may sound old school, but if that is something you're feeding your spirit, you're going to wonder why you constantly trip up and fall. You need to change your thinking 
and that which you follow and listen to and allow the Spirit of Christ to dwell in you richly. You can't be torn between two opinions. I'll never forget the time I, I walked into the place, and I was, I'm the school of 70s rock. Best era, if you were going to listen to rock, that was the best fight going to the best era. And I listened to it, listened to it. God set me free to something more powerful in my spirit. The true rock, Jesus Christ. So I saw this CD. Rhonda says, you don't want to get that. I said, oh, man, it's got some of my old favorites on there. <laughs> like a dinghy. I bought it, and I started listening to it. It was like, ah, I was listening to that music. Now, through born again, Holy Ghost ears, spiritual ears. I said, they're saying that? Ah, that's no, I just won't listen to that song. So I went to the next one. Ah, music sounded great. Their message was horrible. Magic carpet ride. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm not even going to tell you what I know that song says. Hello? But this is the stuff sometimes we feed ourselves in our spirits, and we wonder why we're spiritually dead, and we can't hear God at times. We can't be torn between two opinions. Hallelujah. Verse, God, verse 27 again, it says, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's on a journey. Or a peradventure, he's asleep. He must be awake and shout louder. Verse 28, and they cried aloud and they cut themselves. Isn't it amazing how far Satan will take you? You got young people cutting themselves. This is nothing new to cutting yourself. They couldn't get no answer, so they were screaming and jumping up and down and cutting themselves. It says here, manner of knives and lancets till blood gushed out upon them. 850. That's a lot of blood. That's a lot of jumping and screaming. No fire. Because it's not a God. Verse 29, And it came to pass, when midday had passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor none to answer, nor any that even regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was as broken as could be. The first thing we need to see happening in church is your altar repaired. You can no longer bring the things where you have to slash yourself or shout and jump up and down. You have to bring yourself holy before God and lay it all on the altar. Hallelujah. Verse 31, And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of sons of Jacob, and unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. You've been given a new name. Live it, act it, and believe it. There's a new name written down in glory. Live up to that name. Hallelujah. Live up to that name that the Lord has given you. You are born of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the stones he built in the altar, the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in the order that to cut the bullock to pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, pour it on the offering, sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do this a second time. And they did. A second time. And he said, I'd do it a third time. And they did a third time. And the water ran around about the altar and filled up the trench also with water. <clears throat> and it came to pass at the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, and hear me. 
that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice, it consumed the wood, it consumed the stones and the dust, and licked up all the water that was in the trench. The bullock, the wood, the stones, the dust, and all the water. What was left? The fire of God. That all-consuming power that God is God. That same fire that burned the bush but didn't consume it. That same fire that burns in our Lord and Savior's eyes of a passion and love for the children of Israel, for you and I. He has fire in his eyes. That same fire that has compassion and passion for the lost to be saved is also the same consuming fire that's going to fall upon Satan and upon the nation that comes against his name in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then fire fell upon them. Verse 39. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord... He is God, the Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. You see, once you give your life to the Lord, you're going to have to slay some sins in your life. Let me repeat that, rewind. Once you give your life to Christ, you're going to have to take your sins down to the Kishon River and bury them there. That's why we, we honor and we have water baptism. It's a sign to us that we're dying to ourselves and resurrecting in the new life of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise the Lord. Our God can hear. Our God said he can hear this morning. He's here to hear your voice. But you've got to bury your sin. You've got to leave it there. Stop bringing it up. Hallelujah. There's only one need for one resurrection, and it ain't for your sin. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up and eat and drink. For there is a sound of abundance of rain. Do you see the process for revival to happen? God's got to be God in your life. Fire will come and consume it. And then he'll consume the sin. He'll empty you out of all the things. But then you've got to bury some stuff. You've got to take some things that's held you back and tripped you up. And you've got to bury that thing and get rid of it. We don't need to label what they are. You know what drags you down. You know what pulls you back into the world on a daily basis. But yet so many times we use the things of the world to try to compete and say, hey, we're godly and listen to what I do. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be a man. That's not being a man. Humble yourself on the side of the Lord and he will lift you up. Real men cry. Real men don't get in the face of others and shout them down with their language. Hmm? You stand up with the word of God and you stand in the holiness of God and let him consume you. There's some folks here this morning at the close of service, you need to come to this altar and bury those things once and for all in your life and never pick them up again. You know what they are. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. We know, and I said, fire knows what happens. Pastors love to do ceremonies where people are born again and you send them on home to be with the Lord. I do not want to do ceremonies when there's questions about their life. I'm no one's judge, but it sure gives your pastor a whole lot better heart to knowing we're sending you off to glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. That, that was free. <laughs> and trust me, it's really good for you to know when you're at that death's door that there is confidence in who you believe in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 42. And so Ahab went up to eat and drink, 
And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. He went up and he looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again. This happened seven times. This is the same guy that prayed one time and fire came down and ate up everything. But now he's having to pray seven times for rain. You see, God wants you to be serious. We've been having intercessory prayer for months now. Well over a year, I believe, now. And we have seen things happen in our midst because of intercessory prayer and seeking God. But we're not done. I said, we're not done. We're going to keep pursuing. We're going to keep praying. Hallelujah. And he said unto his servant, go up. Look toward the sea. And he went up and looked. And there was nothing. He said, go seven times. Verse 44. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Out of all the midst of the sea, one little hand rose up. The sea also represents a people. God always compared, he says, I saw them and it looked like a sea. So out of the sea of all the people, out of this little sea right here, maybe we'll call it a pond, farmer's pond, <laughs> who's going to be that little hand it's going to rise up out of that sea. Who's going to be the one to rise up out of the sea of land in the United States of America? Who's going to be that hand that's going to rise up that will break open the gates of heaven and pour out His Spirit one more time like we have never seen before? Who's going to be the one that's willing to sacrifice themselves and to pray until God moves? Could that hand be you? Hallelujah. Verse 44, and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. He said, Go, get up unto Ahab, prepare my chariot, get thee down, the rain stop thee not. Verse 45, and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds. The heaven was black with clouds. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord fell upon Elijah, and he girded his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He's not in a chariot. He is on foot. He took his garment, tucked it in his girdle, and just took off because the power of God hit him so hard, he outran the chariots of Ahab. Hallelujah. When you think you're weak and you can't do it, that's right, you can't. But you can call upon the name of God who answers by fire and He'll give you fire in your bones and He'll rise you up and cause you to run and outrun even the enemy. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. The only fire that can fall from God is on a dead man. Hear me. Was that bull alive on the fire of the sacrifice? Tell me. He was cut to pieces. That calf or cow was dead. You must lay your life on the altar of God as a dead man. And then the fire of God can fall on you. I could see some of the churches today when they come to the altar. They'll, okay, God, I'm going to give you my arm. You fall on that. I, I, I'll give you my leg. I'll, I'll give you my head. Don't fall on all of me. Am I speaking plain this morning? If you want to see the fire of God fall on your life, you got to put your dead body, dead to this world, upon that altar and say, God, fire, fall. Fall on me and consume me. To all that's left is God. Hallelujah. There's nothing left but God. When that happens, people will see revival. We'll see people come in out of taverns, stumbling out, weeping and crying because of the power of the Holy Spirit is so rich there. But when you got the church... Accepting beer and having it in it and preaching God too? How can the Holy Spirit deal with that? I'm speaking to a condition 
of Staunton, Illinois. Speaking condition that if you don't drink, you won't be accepted here. Speaking of a condition that people are bound, that's the first thing they run to when they look for help and assistance in their spirit life because that's what helped them before. We got to lay that stuff down and burn it all up. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Point number one. <laughs> They're quick. Sure. Okay. You must do it the Lord's way. You must come the Lord's way. First Kings 18, 30, 31 says, And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to their number of the tribes of sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. You see, the altar is not broken. The sacrifice is not broken. You see, the altar is that cross right there. The altar is that cross. And the sacrifice is Jesus. It was perfect. And there's no need for us to have to stray any longer. Hallelujah. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the sin penalty we had to pay. Because of this sacrifice, we now have access to the Father through Jesus, his Son. The fire of the Holy Ghost is now available to fall on anyone who will bring that dead carcass and lay it on the cross and surrender their lives to him and allow their lives to be changed from the inside out by the power of the risen Savior and his blood. Then the fire of the Holy Ghost can come on you. Hallelujah. That's real. Number two, you have a new name written down in glory. Hallelujah. My name's written in the Lamb's book of life. It can never be removed from there because I've chosen to keep it there. And also the power of the Son's blood will keep it there. Hallelujah. 1 Kings 18.31 once again says, And Elijah took the twelve stones according to the number of the tribes and the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. You have a new name. You have a name that is a name that's just right there with Jesus. He, he's given you a name because he loves you. He saved you. He's washed you in the power of the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't have to sin. I said you don't have to sin, but you're going to have to change some habits and things in your life. You're going to have to lay it. You have to go down that Kishon River, and you're going to have to bury some stuff. Hallelujah. He arranged the stones on the altar and used the 12 to symbolize who they were. And I imagine after he took each stone, he looked at each tribe and boom. He didn't look at them like, you can choose today. He looked at them with seriousness. He said, you are a child of the Most High God. Act like it. Live like it. He took each stone and rearranged it. He's reminding them who they belong to and who they were supposed to be. Sometimes we get off track and forget who we're supposed to be. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You say, man, Artie, I just can't do it myself. You're right. You can't. We've had folks come up here and say, I want to be more like Jesus. You are on the right track. When you say that prayer, you're on the right track. We will never be like him until we see him face to face. He's given you the power and ability to surrender your life and deny yourself and take up the cross. Hallelujah. Number three, God reveals himself by fire. Verse 38 of 1 Kings 18 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and stones and the dust were licked up and the water and the trench was licked up. Verse 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces before the Lord and said, God, the Lord, He is God. God showed passion for Israel by giving everything He had, by giving His only Son whom they rejected, by giving His only Son who died on the cross that they built. Hallelujah. But He loved them anyway. That while they were at sinners like you and I, He died for them. What was the people's response when that fire fell? They cried out, The Lord was God. That is why we need revival in our church and in our land. So this dying world who's wrapped up in trying to take care of their own pet pen sin and trying to get laws to justify and trying to now even make the church to say, hey, you got you got to come alongside us and agree or we're going to tax the church. We're going to do this. Go ahead. God will just give us more money. God will just supply it. Do you hear me? We will not bow down to the things and the cares of this world. This church will stand for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in holiness and all purity because He is God. He is God. Hallelujah. 
We really need to see the demonstration of God's love and, and power manifested here. Do you think that's going to make everybody happy? Huh, just look in the book of Acts. It made the religious, it made the religious people angry. They started creating up lies, taking them to jail. It wasn't the sinners. Hear me. It wasn't the sinners. Can't you just compromise, Art? Can't you just give in a little so we can just lock arms together so we all sing Kumbaya? No. I sing Kumbaya with one. His name is God. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His name is Jesus. That's who I'll sing Kumbaya with. Hallelujah. He's the one that's coming by anyway. Hallelujah. Not the Supreme Court Justice. Oh, all dressed in their regal robes with great wisdom. Bah! They need to get on their knees before God, rend their robes, and repent. I pray we're recording. Send it on tomorrow. They need to rend their robes and repent. Our president needs to rend his suit and repent. Because God cannot be God in this nation if we continue to honor the things of Satan in this world. Hallelujah. That's not hate, that's love. I don't want to see any of those folks burning in all eternity. <laughs> Number four, you need to prepare for abundance of rain. 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46 in closing says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said unto his servant, Go up now, toward, look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again. He did this seven times. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a cloud out of the sea. Like a man's hand, he said, Go up and saith unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot. And get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds. That's revival, folks. Who is the God of the air? Satan. We need to block his strategies from getting to this earth to stop him polluting your relations, lives, and minds so they can have an opportunity to turn to God. We need to shut up the heavens from Satan and open the heavens of God. Hallelujah. And Ahab rode ahead and went to Jezreel. Verse 46, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab in the entrance of Jezreel. You notice the rain didn't come right away. They had to pray and be obedient to God. You cannot lose hope when you don't see the glory of God instantly or immediately. But you must continue to be faithful to God. And he will pour down abundance of rain. There are things that the Lord has showed me I have not shared with very many people. And things that I have not shared with no people, in fact, some things. They're pregnant in my spirit that I know God wants to do and can do. But it takes the people of God rising up out of the sea of the world and becoming that cloud unto the Lord. It only takes a little bit to spring open the gates. I watched last night this, this like a documentary movie about super volcano. And uh, yeah, everybody's going, Ugh. I love watching that kind of stuff. And just, just for interest's sake. Just not because, oh yeah, I want to get tuned into all that stuff and get carried away. They say, oh, now there's a 7% chance that the big earthquake's coming in California. It's really elevated. I said, but there's a 93% chance it's not. <laughs> there's a 100% chance you're going to go to hell if you don't give your life to Jesus. Let's put that on Facebook. Let's say also there's a 100% chance you're going to make heaven. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Let me step aside here for a moment. But I praise God. <laughs> might want to bring me down a little bit. That's, uh, whoa, hallelujah. I'm just here to tell you, in that super volcano, in that documentary... They said that one little spew out of the part of that magma, just one, the size of a regular volcano, would cause it to trigger that whole huge caldera 
to just spring forth into a mega volcano. And I got to think it spiritually. Why can't in Staunton, Illinois, we see this area burst forth with the power of God, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this world can't contain it any longer, and it just starts bursting up everywhere. And they showed how the clouds would just shift, and they would go whatever which way the wind was blowing, and it would cover two-thirds of the United States. And the longer it lasted, it would ultimately cover the earth. And I started getting excited about an explosion of a supervolcano. I said, God, if you could do that geographically upon this earth, what could you do spiritually if Dave or Tammy, Mike, or any one of us, that something would just burst forth and we couldn't stop it. And as long as there's live magma, live Holy Ghost fire in that spirit, and the longer it continues to spew out, others will start bursting forth and see the power in the hand of God. And it covered and blanket the world. Are you kidding me? That could happen. Yes, go ahead. Praise the Lord. If God can fall, upon a bull and a couple pieces of wood and a stone and revive a whole nation. He can fall on this bull and he can burn him up. Yeah, you go ahead. That's all right. You, you enjoy that. He can fall on this old heifer and he can consume him and let nothing remain but the power of God. Amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. This morning... We talked about in order to have the fire fall, you've got to lay yourself on the altar. Every piece. He cut that bull up with knife. You need to see the Holy Spirit is much more gentle. He uses the sword of the Spirit. He uses His Word. He used His Word this morning to just take a nip, just a cut, Away things out of your life. So this morning, as we open these altars, that God would draw you to let Him cut away some stuff in your life. You want to be more like Jesus? Come to the altar. And not just here, but every day of your life, go before your altar before the Lord and allow Him to do surgery. Allow Him to cut away the things of the world. And then see fire come down. You can't promote and push and say, Pentecost Sunday, everyone in our church can be filled with the Holy Ghost. No. The fire will fall on you when you lay all on the altar and seek to serve and live your life completely to Jesus. The fire will fall on you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This morning, the altar call is very simple. Very, very simple. But very important for you, for me. That if there's things in your life, let me retract that. That if you know you've not surrendered your all to Him, there's things in your life you've not surrendered then you need to come to the altar and spend some time with God in prayer. Just you and God. If that's you this morning, come. No hands raised. Just come. Let's give God room for space to work on our lives. If that's you this morning, you know there's things in your life. When I get done announcing, I'm going to the altar. Your pastor is going to the altar because he needs to have things surgically removed from his life so that I can have more of the fire of God in me. Now this morning, where do you stand between you and God? Is this going to be another Sunday when you reject his call? Or are you going to come to the altar? Some of you may not be able to kneel and come sit in these front pews. That's great. God knows your heart. That's the altar. That's the altar this morning. Come. 
Just lay your, it's just you and the Lord. It's just you and the Lord. Come. Come, you that are weak and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Maybe you don't understand everything going on in your life. Say, man, I, I, I live a good life. I'm a good person. Hallelujah. But God wants you to be His, 100% His. Come to the altar of the Lord, and He will give you strength. He will renew you this morning.